Welcome to Basketball Cinema, where we revisit the most important and iconic games in NBA history. My name's Jay, and today we're looking at Game 7 of the 1969 NBA Finals between the Boston Celtics and LA Lakers. Yeah, a new oldest game ever covered here on the channel! Today marks the first episode in a brand new 10 part series I've cooked up for the channel. Looking at epic performances and playoff losses. Boy, a, a 10 part series, that's like, uh, that's a pretty huge commitment. In this series, we'll highlight players who have had iconic individual games in high leverage moments, but who would find themselves taking an L at the end of it, either in that specific game, in the series, or both. I'm choosing to shine a light on these moments because in the words of Peter Quill, You know what I see? Losers. I mean, like, folks who have lost stuff. Exactly. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. As you can see in the title and thumbnail of this video, the first loser, I, I, I mean person who's lost stuff, that we're looking at today is Jerry West. For all the flack LeBron James has gotten over the past decade or so for losing numerous times in the NBA Finals, West was kind of the original LeBron in that sense. As a member of the LA Lakers, he'd lose in the NBA Finals eight times in his NBA career, including seven times in a row before finally winning a ring in 1972 with six of those losses being doled out by the Boston Celtics. Yeah, it's pretty understandable why Jerry has a dislike for basically the entire city. I haven't been to Boston since I stopped playing basketball, and, and uh, but it's just something I didn't want to do. A lot of old bad memories. I'll be dropping a number of clips from Jerry West into this video, because at 83 years of age, he is still sharp as a tack and full of wisdom about the current NBA and his legendary career. While he seems to be the most gentle and kind soul now, Jerry was an absolute killer on the court as a young man in the 1960s. He was an all-star in each of his 14 seasons, he made all NBA 12 straight seasons from 62 through 73, and averaged north of 30 points a game in 6 of his 9 NBA Finals appearances. As established, however, there was always a green machine standing in his way. I had great respect for the Celtics. We lost some really tough playoffs uh, against them, and uh, I thought there was two times we should have won, and we didn't win. And those are the things that you will take to your grave. Um, I'm still tormented by those losses, to be honest with you. One of those two times the Lakers should have beat the Celtics, as referenced by Jerry West, was in 1969, where we meet the two teams today. Boston had won 10 of the previous 12 NBA titles and was at the tail end of their gargantuan dynasty. However, they sported a record of just 48 and 34 in 69 and were clearly a less powerful entity than in years gone by. The Lakers, meanwhile, had completed their ninth season in Los Angeles after moving from Minneapolis in 1960 and were atop the West with a 55 and 27 record. They'd lost in the NBA Finals five of the previous seven years each time to the Celtics. The 1969 Finals were an absolute battle as expected, with the team splitting the first four games before LA took a 3-2 series lead, which the Celtics erased to force a championship deciding Game 7. Just a few disclaimers I need to make before we jump into the action. First, you're about to see the NBA from an era that, uh, well, is completely different. I'm not going to sit here and make jokes throughout the entire video comparing it to the current day, but uh, just be prepared in case you haven't seen a lot of 1960s action before. Second, footage from this era is basically impossible to come by, so unfortunately I only have the fourth quarter to break down and show you. It's a bit disappointing I must admit, but trust me, this will be worth the watch regardless. Here, I'll show you. The fourth quarter began with the LA Lakers down 15 points? This is notable because prior to the game, Lakers owner Jack Kent Cook had ordered thousands of balloons to be dropped when the Lakers won, as well he had placed flyers in every seat in the LA Forum promoting the forthcoming championship celebration. What's that saying about counting chickens before the- Never mind. It's also notable that Jerry West was playing through a leg injury at this point in the finals. He'd scored just 26 points in game six, but was already up to 27 points through three quarters here in game seven. Anyways, Wilt Chamberlain out jumping Bill Russell on a jump ball, leading directly to an easy finish by Tom Hawkins for the Lakers. 35 year old Sam Jones getting the Celtics on the board in the fourth, running off a free throw line dribble handoff from Russell and fading away beautifully over Wilt. First look at our man, Jerry West, who dribbled hard twice before pulling up with his signature smooth jumper, he was off, but the Lakers made 
maintain possession. Sam Jones would get whistled for his fifth foul of the game, sending Wilt to the line and sending Jones to the bench. And of course, Sam's fifth foul, not near as critical as Wilt Chamberlain's fifth foul. So uh, yeah, th that was a brick. Also, yes, Wilt too was playing cautiously with five fouls of his own. Allow me to point out here that referees in 1969 were on one. I mean, they called literally everything. I should also make note that in 1969, every single non-shooting defensive foul resulted in a single free throw attempt for the player that got fouled. So even a simple reach-in call, it resulted in a free throw. But it also got you the ball back as a defensive team. Super weird rule. Anyways, Elgin Baylor looking super modern on this play, facing up against Bailey Howell, blowing past him into the lane where he hung and hit for two. The Celtics were in a running mood though, as Bill Russell bolted up the court at age 35, beating out the Lakers for a free dunk. Let's add more foul trouble to the mix. As Jerry West took a nice feed from Wilt in the post, getting hit by Russell near the rim, West to the stripe for a pair where he'd make one of two, while Bill would play the game out with five fouls. This is our first opportunity to see Jerry West in action. And what a treat it truly is. 1969 was a big year for the man known as Mr. Clutch, as artist Alan Siegel would design the NBA logo that we still have today using West as the prototype. On the court, Jerry would average 26 points, 7 assists per game, seeing his numbers dip just a touch with the addition of Wilt Chamberlain. One of the smartest minds we still have in basketball, Jerry West knew adding Wilt was something his Lakers needed to do to keep up with the Celtics. In this league, we talk about greatness of players, how many championships they win. Well, trust me, there's a lot of these great players, if they didn't play with the right people, they wouldn't win championship. And you, you need good fortune, you need great teammates, uh, you need good health, and that never seemed to happen for us. Even with 14 teams in the league at the time, the margins were so slim for putting together a championship winning team. Even in the final year of their dynasty, the Celtics boasted a roster which included five future Hall of Fame players, while the Lakers had just three. Like Jerry said, you need good teammates to win. Watch this possession with an eye on Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. Not wanting to risk fouling out, Wilt looked as though he couldn't have cared less about playing defense on Russell. Meanwhile, Bill, for an entire possession didn't once square up and face the basket. Ultimately, it didn't matter though, as Bailey Howell pulled up for a sweet deuce, giving Boston a 17-point advantage. Back the other way, a role reversal as now Bill Russell was the one playing some Olay defense, allowing a simple drop-step finger roll from Wilt to Still. The 1968-69 season marked the arrival of Wilt Chamberlain, aka the Big Dipper in Los Angeles. He had been traded from the 76ers and was given a massive $250,000 contract contract you know, massive for 1968. Chamberlain reportedly butted heads with then Lakers coach Bill Van Breedekolf, as well with Elgin Baylor, but remained friendly throughout his time in LA with Jerry West. Wilt had led the NBA in scoring for eight straight seasons to begin his career, but his final two in Philadelphia saw him swing below 25 points a game for the first time in his career. In his first season with the Lakers, the Stilt had adopted a seemingly more well-rounded game. My first seven years, I scored a lot of points. Then I stopped scoring on my own volition. Uh, I tried to do other things. I was asked to do other things, and that's what I did. For the last seven years, uh, it wasn't about points to me. It was about trying to do other other things. Even as his numbers were slowly beginning to decline, the 1969 playoffs were pretty shocking by Wilt standards. He'd averaged just 14 points a game alongside West and Baylor, but did continue to do so with his trademark efficiency. No, but one thing I do know, that all the years while I was usually scoring all those points, I was leading the league in percentile shooting. And that's also important because if you take all the shots, then you should be making the highest percentage. Wilt was an analytics nerd. Wow, real hoopers are in shambles right now. The Celtics appeared to be in cruise control at this point in the fourth, ready to rain on the Lakers parade. A fellow by the name of M. Bryant controlling things on the perimeter, up to 18 points on the game with a deep jumper. Big Bill not exactly known for his offensive prowess at this point in his career, missing a short banker, Wilt tearing down the defensive board. Lakers unable to take advantage however, as Elgin Baylor created space but missed from the baseline. We've seen him at the free throw line, but here's our first Jerry West field goal. Assessing the Celtics defense from the right wing, turning over his left shoulder with a silky fade just prior to the arriving double team 
team from John Havlicek. Playing back to the basket from that area of the floor was a bit odd, but that jump shot looking timeless. Under nine minutes remaining now in game seven, the Celtics wisely wasting the shot clock, but a long launch from Bryant was off. The Lakers immediately going to their man with a plan, as six foot three West working from the mid post on Larry Siegfried, pump faking and drawing a foul. Uh, that also, that was a very modern NBA move to get free throws. Jerry would connect on one of two, cutting the deficit down to 14. West was backpacking the Lakers at this point, fighting around a screen on defense to cleanly block the jump shot of Larry Siegfried. That defense led to offense in a real hurry. A little more than eight minutes remaining in the game. Erickson, they're looking for Jerry West. Howell switches off on West. Now, within 12 points. West forcing the Celtics to call timeout? I'm vibing with these Jerry jumpers, man. He really did have some game. Jerry West finally missed an attempt from the outside, but the Lakers secured the board. Tom Hawkins, though, was sent back by a clean Bill Russell rejection. The ball would eventually make its way to Wilt, who was hacked by John Havlicek and sent to the line. Johnny Havs with his fifth foul, but sending Chamberlain to the line was smart as he'd brick one of two. More West chicanery on the offensive end, drawing another foul, this time on Sam Jones, as the future Hall of Famer would foul out. He'd actually retire after this game, so uh, see you later, Sam. Jerry would make his free throw, bringing him up to 34 points in the game. Lakers now down 11. Another brick launched by M. Bryant, and after some ball movement around the perimeter, it was 34-year-old Elgin Baylor for the purple and gold connecting on a jump shot. Lakers deficit now cut to single digits. One of my great joys in putting together this video was going back to hear Jerry West talk about his relationship with the late great Elgin Baylor. Elgin passed away in March of 2021. S such a loss, man. Rest in peace. Jerry joined the Lakers as a rookie in 1960 at the age of 22, with Elgin the undisputed leader of the team and his elder at age 26. Over a three-year stretch from 1960 through 1963, Baylor would average 35 points, 17 rebounds per game, and he was only six foot five. In addition, during the 1961-62 season, Baylor was called to active duty as a U.S. Army reservist, meaning he was only available for games on the weekend. Like, are you serious, bro? Another fun fact is that Elgin coined the nickname Tweety Bird for Jerry West as a result of his unusually high-pitched voice. Well, I know against Baltimore, now we felt that uh, we would be uh, pretty effective against those guys because they are a good rebounding team. I gotta say, that one kind of makes sense. Together, Baylor and West would lose in the finals five times. Elgin suffered a knee injury that kept him out of the 1965 finals and was never quite the same afterwards. But a career highlighted by 11 All-Star appearances and 10 All-NBA nods is nothing to look down on. To just to be on the same court with someone I idolize, can you imagine sitting in the locker room and after a few years, I'm on the All-Pro team and I'm looking over there and I'm sitting looking at someone I idolize that I get to play with every day? Very special. Unfortunately for Elgin and Jerry, Baylor would retire due to injury just prior to the Lakers finally winning a chip in 1972. John Havlicek was Mr. Reliable for these Celtics. A really nice looking jumper of his own to stop the bleeding a bit, he was up to 24 points in this game. This right here might be my favorite, oh yeah, this is a game from a completely different era of possessions. Jerry West dribbling up the court, using his right hand. St still using his right hand? He he's just pounding the rock. Uh oh, he's shooting a 12 foot jumper and it's money. Uh, okay, uh, where was his left hand? And where was the defense? Everybody in this arena knows where that ball's going when the Lakers get it to Jerry West. Very true. Will was basically non-existent offensively in this Lakers game plan. It was all Jerry W. Wildly important moment here in Game 7. As Will came down with a defensive board, you could see him laboring. He was clearly in a bad way, as he essentially couldn't move on the court. Yep, yep, just, just rub some of that potion there on his knee. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm sure he's just fine, doctor. Good stuff. Surprisingly, whatever Wilt had rubbed on his knee didn't do the trick, and he would check out of the game. This would become a wild point of contention for this Lakers team. Wilt would end up sitting for the remaining five minutes of Game 7, obviously causing some controversy. Many people, including Bill Russell, accused Wilt of being soft for being taken out of the game for a seemingly minor injury but Wilt insisted that he was indeed injured with a torn ligament in his knee. Years later though, Wilt would also claim he asked Coach Butch to be put back in the game, but the coach refused out of arrogance and because of the petty beef they had. Now I'm confused Wilt, were, were you actually hurt or was it the coach's choice? 
As far as I can tell, it was actually a combination of both. As we'll see, upon Wilt exiting the game in clear pain, the Lakers would go on a pretty big run. When seeing the Lakers with a shot at glory, Wilt insisted he was good to go, but at that point, Coach Butch felt he had a chance to stick it to Wilt by keeping him on the bench. So like, uh, bad decisions all around, yep, and Butch would be fired following the season. Throughout that chaos, Jerry West found himself back at the free throw line where he was living like 2006 Dwayne Wade. He made both, and it was now a seven point game. After yet another miss from M. Bryant for the Celtics, I mean, who else would you expect the Lakers to go to? And Jerry West, five points now, and the Lakers come back, 40 points for Jerry West. My guy Jerry wanted no part of scoring in the paint. He was abusing the Celtics from the mid-range. This dude M. Bryant was shooting the Celtics out of the game, meanwhile. Another miss. Jerry West finally getting his uh, left hand involved. He was getting a pre-rule change Trey Young whistle in this game. Sent to the line again where he'd make a pair. Just a three-point deficit now for LA. Wilt's replacement in the game was some super tall white dude named Mel Counts, who purely stroked a free throw line Jimmy to make it a one-point all game. The forum in LA was rocking by the way. They could smell victory. Bill Russell fumbling the bag in the clutch for Boston, missing from point blank under the rim. The Lakers were unable to take advantage, but on the ensuing Celts possession, Jerry West heroically put his body on the line as if he were Pietro Maximoff sacrificing himself for our guy Clint Barton on Sokovia. Under two minutes remaining, we finally get a big time Bill Russell play as he darted off ball defensively to disrupt a pass intended for Elgin Baylor under the rim. As I pointed out a couple times, 1969 would mark the final chapter in the Boston Celtics historic dynasty. Three years earlier in 1966, the Celtics beat Jerry West and the Lakers in the finals, giving former head coach Red Auerbach a championship retirement from coaching. Red would ban the front office for the next, uh, I don't know, million years in Boston as the one and only Bill Russell took over as head coach. But like, he was also playing at the same time. I, I don't even know, bro. That's amazing. The story goes that three former Celtics, Frank Ramsey, Bob Cousy, and Tom Heinsohn all turned down the coaching job. Heinsohn felt that he couldn't handle the often grumpy Russell and suggested Bill himself take over as player coach. At the time, his promotion to coach didn't garner full public support. I think it was the first time I ever remember that a coach or a manager has been appointed and there was questions about his qualifications, which irritated me to no end because I knew it was strictly a racial thing because uh, they hire coaches out every day that uh, no one says uh, publicly anyway, is he qualified? Or that much discussion about what kind of coach you make. Fortunately though, Bill wasn't in the business of making folks happy. It didn't bother me because I didn't care what they thought, really. And uh, those questions, I just said, well, okay, you ask your questions, I'm not gonna worry about it. You, get to, you ask your questions, you get a silly questions to the answer and we get that over with. And I go about doing what I want to do. Bill Russell was the first black coach in North American pro sports and the first one to win a championship. He's also commanded unparalleled levels of respect from NBA greats since his time in the league, including, of course, Jerry West. Because he brought a, an element to the game that was about winning, uh, the greatest winner we've ever seen in our league. He was just a, 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 a guy who kind of flew under the radar, but he had a, like a regal-like effect on the game. He just... He was just incredible and uh, more importantly, a friend and someone that I've greatly admired for all these years. Back to the clutch moments of game seven. Keith Erickson nearly coming up with a big time steal for the Lakers, ending up poking the ball into the hands of Don Nelson, who'd flick up a jumper from the free throw line, getting a fortuitous bounce home. Jerry West staring down a Celtics double team elected to rise and fire, but he missed short. Under a minute remaining now, Boston turning the ball over with an off ball foul. It was a bit tough to see here, but a big time play from Bill Russell. 40 seconds to go, Mel Counts drives on Russell, can't get it up and Russell takes it away. Huge block from Bill. I can only imagine what Wilt Chamberlain was thinking from the bench as he watched uh, Mel Counts attempt a shot from behind the backboard with a game on the line. Larry Siegfried would make a pair of free throws to put the Celtics up five. A and then... Now it's a five point lead with 22 seconds to go. It's stolen by John Havlicek. A Brutal turnover in the clutch by Johnny Egan, and definitely not the first super clutch deal by the late great John Havlicek. The Lakers forced a steal.
Beal and Negan made a layup to cut the Celtics lead down to two, but that was it. For anyone hoping for a new story in the NBA, it wasn't meant to be. An 11th ring in the span of just 13 years. In a losing effort in Game 7, Jerry West posted 42 points, 13 rebounds, and 12 assists on a bad leg. A truly historic individual performance by an all-time great. Such an impactful performance that Bill Russell would later say, Los Angeles has not won the championship, but Jerry West is a champion. Trying to sum up the legacy of the 1969 NBA Finals is pretty impossible because, well, you know, there were like a million Hall of Famers playing in this game, all with very successful careers. For Jerry West, losing in the 1969 NBA Finals was clearly a career-defining moment. For the series, he averaged 38.7 assists per game, including a monster triple-double in the deciding game, and as a result, was named Finals MVP even in a losing effort. By the way, uh, Jerry, not a big fan of getting that award. And that was the most valuable player in a seven game loss in a series against the Celtics. I don't know of any other player that's ever had that honor and it's not an honor. What do you remember from that? Oh, just how stupid it was that I would receive that and I wasn't part of the winning team. It was not, didn't seem right. It was meaningless for me regardless of how I played. Again, I'll emphasize how thoroughly dominant the Celtics had been in the 1960s by pointing out that this was Jerry West's sixth time in eight seasons losing to Boston in the finals, and it had legitimately broken the man. I honestly wanted to quit. I didn't want to, and it, I was in a prime in my career, and I, I didn't want to play anymore. For me, I did some incredible things in the playoffs, and it never seemed to be good enough. A couple of those games in particular, I replayed them, and regardless of how I played, I always blamed myself for us losing. And that's a terrible burden to carry around with you. It's a terrible burden. It's honestly tough listening to such a great man recount the lowest moments of his life. But on the bright side, after losing again in the finals in 1970, this time to the Knicks, West and Wilt Chamberlain would power the Lakers to a finals victory in 1972, finally allowing Jerry to have some closure in his unbelievable NBA career. Meanwhile, after winning 11 championships in 13 years, including the latter two as player coach, Bill Russell was completely burnt out after 1969. He'd long battled with his own public perception in regards to how he was viewed as a basketball player in Boston, and as a result, he retired after the 1969 season, cutting ties with the organization entirely. No, seriously, he didn't even return to Boston for the customary championship parade. He just up and retired without alerting the organization. Bill Russell, man, he's always been an original. For each game covered here on Basketball Cinema, I'll be giving out three awards, beginning with the Clint Hawkeye Barton Award for Most Underrated Performer. I don't care. Which goes to Don Nelson. While the 1969 finals were dominated mostly by the combined six Hall of Famers on the court on both sides, Don Nelson flew under the radar and produced 16 points on 6 of 12 shooting in Game 7, including what was the game-clinching jump shot. Nelson would eventually make the Hall of Fame as a coach in 2012. The Rick Dalton <laughs> Award for Most Recognizable Moment goes to Red Auerbach and Sam Jones talking about Jerry West's finals performance. I want to say that Jerry West was Absolutely fantastic. That was one of the greatest exhibitions I ever saw in my life. Uh, I, I can only speak for Red because I had to play him all through the series. And Jack, I tell you, I had to say a little prayer every time he got the ball. <laughs> what a couple characters, man. And finally, the Mark Jackson. With all due respect. Award for weirdest moment in this game goes to uh, the aforementioned Don Nelson and his response to missing a free throw. Trying to keep him from getting the hot hand here. <laughs> I'm not sure why I found this so funny, but grown men certainly acted differently back in the late 60s. I mean, look at that little angry jump. I love it. And that's it. The Boston Celtics beat the LA Lakers 108-106 on May 5th, 1969. Jerry West continued to be thwarted by his foes in green in truly devastating fashion. If you enjoyed this episode of the show, please consider dropping a like down below. And if you can see yourself watching a few more of these, I'd suggest you hit that subscribe button as well. Just go ahead and do it. Also, leave me a comment. Next week is part two of the epic performances and playoff losses series. We're looking at one of MJ's many victims. But until that one, my name's Jay, and this has been Basketball Cinema.
Yo, thanks so much for watching another video here, y'all. Hope you're excited for this new series. We got a lot of just legendary players and iconic moments to look through. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of this channel, but like specifically playoff loss, you guys get what I'm saying. Ah, I'm so excited. So many great games upcoming. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. Tell a friend, do, do it for me, okay?